from downtown Milwaukee, welcome to Money Talk with Bob Landis. Each week, professional advisors from Landis and Company Investments discuss the latest financial developments, offering timely insight and long-term perspective. This is Money Talk for April 7th, Good Friday, 2023. Check in the calendar. The Brewers are home this weekend with the St. Louis Cardinals, and then they're off to the West Coast. Your Milwaukee Bucks, who are the best record in the East, have their last home game of the regular season Friday night with the Grizzlies. Sunday, they're in Toronto, and then it's the playoffs, baby. And Friday is National Beer Day, and it's Good Friday. Kind of feels sacrilegious. <laughs> Okay, where's the cocaine bear when you need them? Belgium has seized so much cocaine from smugglers operating through their port of Antwerp that it needs to build more incinerators to burn the coke. But wait, there's more. Recently, a giant stash of three and a half tons of cocaine with Batman logos on the bundles was found floating off the coast of New Zealand. Batman is a cokehead? Robin, yeah, but not Batman. <laughs> As we know, TikTok is everywhere these days, good and bad, so here's the latest TikTok challenge. What you need to do is simple, but stupid. You eat a fruit roll-up, wrapper and all. And China is collecting information on these knuckleheads. Good luck with that. (laughs) Speaking of dumb, a Missouri woman got arrested and charged with four felonies for driving her car through a gas station with three kids on the roof. Not in the bed of a pickup. Oh, no, on the roof of her car. Well, I'm shocked this didn't happen in Florida. (laughs) And finally, according to the Center for Disease Control, those are the folks that got us through the COVID-19 pandemic. They do more than fight diseases. They monitor the health of the country. Well, according to the CDC, Americans on average have 11 sex partners in their lifetime. For a bright, shiny new dime, can you name them? And not out loud. (laughs) On the podcast today, we have Dave Sandstrom, Adam Bailey, Joel Dreesing, and wrapping up the week, Here's Kyle Tedding. Well, thanks, Max. A bit of a mixed week. The NASDAQ down 1.1%, closing at 12.88 Thursday. Markets closed Friday. The S&P 500 down a tenth of a percent, down four points, closing at 41.05. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average posting a positive number, up six-tenths of a percent, closing at the bell, up 626 points on Thursday, At 33,485 for the year, the Dow now up 1.6%, including dividends, the S&P up 7.4, and the NASDAQ, a pretty stellar 15.8, going through uh, a quarter plus a week now. You know, I think, Adam, as we look back, um, it's the time of year when, you know, a lot of things are happening, first and foremost, taxes, obviously, Uh, plenty of phone calls on, uh, you know, folks looking for cost bases, folks looking for some guidance. Um, you know, a reminder perhaps there that maybe we should be uh, directing those questions to the appropriate tax parties, uh, your CPA, your tax preparer, uh, going to be better equipped to handle those. But I think more importantly, um, you know, it tends to be when we get the end of that first quarter in, we've got a pretty good idea of what stage has been set for the year. And at least so far year to date, we've gotten a nice little foundation Uh, for what returns look like for the rest of the year. Looking back at, in particular, returns on the stock market, um, you know, it's a strong start to the year. Even more important, going back six months, an even better start. You know, as you talk to clients, what kinds of things are you pointing out? What are you looking at? Well, I think this year's uh, recovery from where we were last fall has a lot to do with earnings and interest rates. And, I mean, you kind of just take a step back, and with all the volatility that we've had this past year. One of the exercises I've been just kind of running through with clients and regular reviews is to try to survey the land at like 30,000 feet. Because you, you just go that far back and all you can see is just the real important stuff, the big things like interest rates, earnings, and valuations. So maybe we just kind of do that now because it goes a long way to explain where we are um, for the moment in terms of market performance. But as we closed um, this week, you know, 10-year treasury, 3.29% historically low borrowing costs for people, for businesses, uh, corporate earnings. Uh, we've finally closed the books on fourth quarter earnings for last year. They were decent. You take a look at earnings expectations for this year, not much anticipated for the first half, but a fair amount of earnings growth expected in the second half of this year. Maybe the market's looking ahead towards what's coming down the pike, and that's where 
uh, you can kind of get the, the the rise in the market so far this year. But uh, for the full year, maybe earnings grow somewhere between two and five percent, give or take. I've seen different estimations, but that's kind of a consensus between you know say two and five. Uh, and then valuations, you know. Um, yeah, stocks are still reasonably priced with the pullback we've had. They're, you know, just above the the long term average for the PE, but still reasonably priced. And you put those three things together: historically low interest rates, rising profitability, reasonably priced businesses. I think that goes a long way to explain, you know, why the the market has recovered from the lows last fall. Uh, and Dave, I think the the question that tends to to come out of this is how much of the rally this year is really a bet on the Fed being able to back off interest rates? How much is a bet on maybe a reacceleration of growth later in the year? You know, I think we put a lot of stock in, um, and maybe incorrectly put a lot of stock in kind of the definition of where we are in the market. Are we in correction? Are we in bull? Are we in bear? Um, perhaps the answer lies somewhere in between all of that right now. And it's been interesting, Kyle, because there has been you know considerable conversations about that. Is you know our our, our stock investors just too optimistic at this point? And and of course it's it's difficult to tell, especially in the short run. Uh, but you know we've for as much talk as there's been in the last twelve months about recession, uh, the you know the situation we're in right now, quite frankly, is anything but recessionary. The economic growth numbers are still strong. We're in an incredibly tight labor market, continuing adding jobs. I mean, even with some of the accelerated layoffs, uh, the new hires are still outpacing those uh, by a significant number. So, you know, one of your best indicators for, for the future is what's going on currently, right? And, and right now, you look at a very strong economy, you look at tight labor market, and then point to some of the things like Adam pointed out with, with earnings and interest rates. It's no wonder that investors are returning to, to stocks. Well, I think you'd expect that corporate America leads the market or leads the economy a little more broadly in that you start to see some of the earnings data weaken as the economy cools, not necessarily you know, in conjunction with it, but leading into it a bit. And so we've already seen some, some weaker earnings than maybe what we would have expected, certainly showing some signs over the next couple of quarters. Now, you know, Adam, as you pointed out, 2 to 5% earnings growth for the year. It's going to come in a pretty disjointed way. It's going to be potentially negative numbers early in the year, followed by some meaningful positives later. And so that question of, all right, how much of this is just pricing in the expectation for growth down the road, and how much of it is, okay, we think this might be a little better than, than what so many doomsayers are saying out there. Candidly, I don't know that it matters that much. You know, the conversation I've been having with clients is you put up with a long period of time in which the only place you really wanted to invest was stocks. And Dave, the, the phrase you threw out just before we started was ZERP, right, this zero interest rate policy. Um, but it created all kinds of kind of hangover effects uh, from, from easy money, from free money almost. And I guess the, the thinking is now – maybe the the winds have shifted just enough to start to paint a little bit of a different picture. Well, quite frankly, uh, Kyle, I'm pleased with the fact that we are back off of zero interest rates. Now, obviously, it, it came with a price last year. I mean, the, the aggressiveness of the Fed was certainly the reason why all asset classes had a very difficult year. But let's face it, we spent 10 years penalizing savers and penalizing people that wanted safe investments and push people into a lot of risky places. I mean, we look at the 10-year average of, of the bond market less than 2% the last 10 years. Uh, stocks over over 12 on the S&P. I mean, those are distorted numbers that, when you look back over history, are, are way outside the norm. So going forward, to, to be able to count on your bond portfolio providing you with reasonable returns and, and quite possibly even above average bond returns uh, moving forward with uh, you know stock market returns probably being a little bit more muted, um, I'm okay with that. It, it it could bring less volatility to a balanced portfolio. You know the phrase that comes to mind for me is past performance is not indicative of future results, and past performance for bonds has been it's it's been anemic for the lack of a better word, and stocks have been quite well, and you know, take a look at where we are now today. 
bonds are starting to offer more competition. They're offering very real competition to some stock money, especially maybe some of the utility sector, dividend payers, the you know, traditional perhaps bond surrogates where you know, now you can get three, four, maybe close to 5% on a high quality short-term bond fund. And now you're starting to rival stock performance. And you know, it, it, I think it just begs the, allo, uh, the the question on allocation. Okay, well, maybe we should be starting to reconsider allocating more towards bonds, pulling from stocks after they've had a chance to recover. You know, I think you look at six month returns for bonds going back to October first, so the fourth quarter of last year, the first quarter of this year, the Bloomberg U.S. Government Credit Index. So just a broad measure of government bonds as well as corporate bonds up better than 5% in a six-month stretch. And yeah, okay, it's really not a fair comparison because the six months before that were terrible. Um, You know, we came through the worst six months we've ever seen for bond funds, certainly in our lifetimes. Um, And so to say, well, yeah, but you're up 5% since then. Yeah, we didn't get it all back yet. But also, the story we were telling six months ago is the exact story that the the two of you, Dave and Adam, are talking about, which is, hey, the opportunity set has changed. Yeah, stocks are great, and long term, we think they're going to be the better source of return. Um, But also, you you put up with some volatility for that. And so I'll take five in a six-month stretch, a five that's been much smoother than what you got in the stock ride. Oh, by the way, the returns on the S&P 500 are up 15 and a half. So a reminder that there's more opportunity in stocks, but also you had to put up with a lot more. You put up with a February that was straight down after a January that was straight up. Um, yeah, that that's going to put some investors at at uh, maybe a little bit of a, an unease. Uh, but of course, know that that's why we use them together. That's why there's more than just one or the other. We're not betting on what's the next right thing. We're, we're putting our money down on the fact that balance is going to get us what we need in aggregate, that when you put these pieces together, it smooths the ride and still make sure you get enough return to get what you're looking for. You know, Joel, uh, you know, the, the big thing that we are keeping an eye on is the labor market. We got news this week on unemployment claims, uh, certainly a bit of an update from last week's number, uh, moving it a little bit higher. But more importantly, this week, maybe signs that we're still seeing strength in the labor market. Yeah, as you know, as Dave, Dave pointed out before, I mean, with a tight labor market, it's hard to say that we're in a recession. Um, and, and we still have signs that we're in a tight labor market, but we're also seeing signs that maybe that's loosening up a little, um, which is good for the economy, which is good for inflation. Um, Ch- Chairman Powell from from the Fed, you know, he has said that one of the things that he's watching is the gap between the number of job openings and the number of unemployed people looking for work. And that uh, we got news this week that the uh, the job openings went down. It went. It was the lowest it's been since May of 2021. It was 9.9 million openings, um, and that compared to 5.9 million. Um, unemployed people looking for work. Not that all those people would fit into those any of those jobs, but uh, it's, it's a good comparison. And th- that's the narrowest gap, that 4 million in between those numbers. That's the narrowest it's been for a while. So um, that's telling us that there's less pressure on wage infl- inflation. So, um, and that's only, you know, one month, but we're, we're seeing more signs that you know, although the labor market is strong, it's maybe get, getting a little weaker. So, and, and also in comparison, so that 9.9 million job openings in February compares to um, the record of 12 million it had just a year ago, just in March. Um, but it also compares to what it was like before COVID. Uh, in February of 2020, that number was 7 million. So even though it's come down from 12 million down to less than 10 million, it's still way up from where it was before COVID. So we're, we're historically at a strong point. And what I appreciate about that conversation is that when you have job openings, that's economic activity that's not happening that should be, right? When you, when you think about it big picture, yeah, okay, maybe somebody in your office is picking up a little more of the slack than they otherwise would have. Um, and so you're not completely losing out on the economic benefit of that worker. But the more you fill those positions, the more you find more and more workers, the more economic activity you should expect for two reasons. One, because that's output that can now be consumed, whether it's goods or services. And two, because 
that worker is also making money that they weren't otherwise making and can turn around and consume those very things that are being made. And so I think if we're talking about an economy that, yeah, we see signs of slowing. Everywhere you look, there's signs that things are getting a little bit slower than they were six months ago, a year ago. It's by design. Of course, it's what the Fed has been trying to do, but also understand that if part of that is that we're filling some of the jobs that are out there, even if it's somebody that was coming from a different position, all these tech layoffs that have uh, been making the news, well, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what the actual labor market looks like, but also those people can find jobs pretty quick right now and we're seeing those job opening numbers come down. As long as they're coming down because people are filling those jobs and not because employers are deciding they don't need to hire, that's economic activity we didn't have before and that's the the thing I think that makes me a little more optimistic that the Fed's doing okay here. Yeah, it's never going to be perfect. There's plenty of room for economic consequence, but but things actually look a little better uh, than maybe we otherwise thought they would. Right. Yeah, we're, we're not talking about recession. You know, we're not having those discussions that we had you know several months ago that recession seemed inevitable or you know that I mean. I guess recession is inevitable, but not that it's going to happen anytime soon now. I mean, it doesn't look that way anyway. And and it is inevitable that we're going to have a recession. And that's another reason why we want, uh, you know, higher than 0% uh, policy because, it, you know, if we have a recession, what's the Fed going to do in terms of lowering interest rates to help the economy go again? You know, we spend a lot of time looking at labor, but there's always plenty of other stuff on the economics, uh, in the economic data each week. Um, not a terribly heavy week, but Joel, anything else that really caught your eye? Uh, just samplings of how it's slowing down, how it's slowing down in, in construction, especially residential construction, how it's slowing down in manufacturing. We had the ISM manufacturing index and factory orders from the Commerce Department. It's even slowing down in um, the services index for the uh, Institute for Supply Management. So we're, again, seeing all those different signs that the economy is still okay but it's slowing down. Well, as always, we enjoy doing the program for you all. Uh, we, we wish you all uh, a happy Easter weekend. Enjoy spring break for those of you that are uh, taking trips or planning to come back to Wisconsin for the snowbirds. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again next week. Thank you for listening to Money Talk with Bob Landis. If you have a financial question you want answered on next week's show, email it to Talk at Landis.com. To keep informed throughout the week, visit our Money Talk page at Landis.com. <laughs>